Okay, in this part four of four, for this voiceover of the grade five passive mobilizations of the spine, uh, in this section, we will talk about the specific techniques as well as the mechanics and creating the artificial barriers and the mid-range barriers of each of the uh, uh, regions. And then we'll also go through the conclusion and some of the additional resources uh, provided. Okay, so let's get into the cervical techniques. So in this section, uh, we'll describe all the cervical techniques and the elements there within. Uh, in the lab section uh, for this part one, we will go through the AA joint as well as the prone cervical thoracic junction and lateral flexion or lateral break technique. Okay, in this next section, we'll actually talk about the specific techniques for the cervical spine. Okay, so when we're thinking about minimal leverage positioning and specifically for the cervical spine, we'll talk about each of the different segments and review some of the concepts that were presented within the pre-lecture material. In the first column, you have your spinal level C0, C1, uh, C1, C2, and C2 through C7, representing the lower cervical spine. In the middle of the column, you have it. You have the label of the natural coupled motions that occur with each of these spinal segment regions. We denote the osteopathic labeling of type one versus type two. The type one is going to be when the side bending and or rotation uh, occur in the opposite direction of one another, and type two is when they occur in the same direction. And then if you're going to uh, attempt to apply the facet apposition uh, of the natural coupled motions with the thrust techniques, then you're going to oppose, it's going to be opposite of that. Uh, uh, the caveat here is that we know in the upper cervical spine, due to the uh, individual's means of orienting themselves visually uh, to the environment, that there can be a lot of uh, uh, heterogeneity as far as the consistency of the couple motions that are seen but ma the majority of the time it would be a type 1 motion where they occur in the opposite direction thus when you ap apply your levers uh, consideration for this would be in the type 2 position where you would side bend and rotate to the same side um, and we'll talk more about this when we actually get into the specific techniques and then it would be opposite of this for the lower cervical spine so if we look at some examples here, so you can see here's the patient's full rotation to the left. Now, regardless of whether you use a prime uh, rotation as the primary lever, as shown here, or lateral flexion as the primary lever, you can see that the secondary lever, uh, be it lateral flexion or rotation respectively, for each of these scenarios is going to be applied in the opposite uh, direction of the initial primary. So a little bit of mental gymnastics, but we'll walk through it. So the first thing to note, we'll use the rotation primary lever, uh, the middle photo as the example. First note that she, the patient's only rotated 50% of her available range. And then there's when it says the primary lever is rotation, the majority of the range of motion that her neck is turned uh, or put into is in rotation versus the lateral flexion. And you can compare that to the lateral flexion being the primary lever. Regardless of which primary lever you utilize, which is gonna be based off patient comfort, available range of motion, as well as the clinician's uh, comfort and expertise, the secondary lever is gonna be in the opposite direction of that with the assumption that these images are denoting the lower cervical spine. All right, taking a, a closer look at both of these uh, options as far as the primary lever that is applied. So in the first column, you have the technique. So your rotary primary lever and thrust would be your upslope where classically your downslope would use the lateral flexion as your primary lever. And then you have the options uh, provided and it, you can use it as a helpful decision tree for yourself that if you're gonna it, say you have a patient that has a stiffer cervical spine and you're using the rotary technique, 
then it's potential that you would lessen or remove the secondary side bending leverage and you wouldn't need to apply as much versus in the more flexible spine incorporating lateral translation and secondary side bending leverage uh, would be helpful in order to create that artificial barrier or that minimal leverage positioning and very similar uh, you can see what is otherwise applied when you do a downslope technique or a lateral flexion being the primary lever. You're going to lessen or remove the secondary rotation lever uh, in the stiffer, in the st stiffer uh, spine. And then with the flexible spine, incorporate lateral translation as well as primary si side bending leverage uh, as an additional means to create that minimal leveraging positioning. Okay, so let us consider Fayette's third law. Introducing motion to a vertebral joint in one plane automatically reduces its mobility in the other two planes. For instance, if we rotate our head to the right, then we will no longer have as much side bending and or flexion or extension of the cervical spine if we would if our head was in that neutral position. And this is going to be helpful when we consider the secondary and even tertiary levers that we apply to create this minimal leveraging positioning. So here's a hypothetical graph where you combine the two levers that we've been discussing within the cervical spine. So you can see that the primary lever here is rotation and then the secondary lever would be side bending. And you can see the uh, the amount of rotation necessary would be great, uh, would be, you know, 60% of the range of the available range of motion because you only have two levers applied. Now, keep this in mind as we look at adding tertiary levers and what happens to the rotation. Okay, so in the example previously given, where you have someone that is, has a little bit more mobility of their spine, maybe you don't take, in order to create, uh, prevent going to that deeper range or end range where you have your barrier leveraging, uh, you would want to add a tertiary lever. And as you add your tertiary lever of side glide and or uh, lateral translation, what you can see is that there's more of an equal balance between uh, the three levers applied. Even though rotation is assumed to be the primary still, you're only using 30% of their range versus their, uh, their 60% as shown in the previous slide because of the tertiary lever that you've applied. Now, with the minimal leveraging position, it goes beyond simply just the joint apposition. And then some of the additional levers that we can also add, and again, this is going to be dependent upon your proficiency, the mobility, and the patient comfort, is that you can will also introduce and teach a local PA shift, which is defined more as an accessory motion rather than an, an, uh, like a PA extension, which would classify as a physiological motion. And then also adding compression uh, of the soft tissue. And this gets directly to the definition of the mineral bowl leverage positioning that uses not only at the apposition of the joints, but also uh, building the and utilizing the tension of the myofascial and ligamentous structures of the neck. And then combining the levers, the purpose of this, right, is that it helps to dissipate the thrust forces necessary and then uses less total range of motion in the primary lever vector by taking up the tension in other planes, consistent with Fryat's third law. Okay, and here's a simple schematic that maybe will further reinforce this concept. So you can see the two possibilities where either rotation or sign bending are your primary levers. And then the uh, subsequent rows denote the different options for your secondary, tertiary, and additional levers applied. So if we stick with uh, possibility one, for instance, so primary is rotation, secondary is side bend, you can add flexion or extension uh, which could be your PA shift. And then you can also use your lateral uh, shift or lateral glide uh, 
that is not shown in this schematic, but it could be your tertiary lever, and then using slight traction and or compression to the cervical spine and the uh, tissues uh, at the particular target segment may further help to reduce the amount of rotation uh, that you would otherwise need and improve the overall comfort making you successful at creating that minimal leveraging positioning versus your barrier positioning. Okay, so before we get into the techniques themselves, let's talk about the types of holds that can be utilized within the cervical spine. Though there's multiple different techniques that are described and different ways of which you can uh, uh, hold the cervical spine to be able to provide the thrust, the two predominant ones that we'll use today is the chin hold and the cradle hold. So first, the chin hold shown here. You can see the starting position in the top image and then the introduction of the primary lever of rotation shown in uh, this, the lower image. The uh, right hand of the operator in this case can be on the particular target segment um, and or the, the arch uh, of the atlas, if this is going to be an upper cervical versus uh, the articular pillar, if this is at a different level. Uh, and you'll, we'll go through this in lab, but you can see that there's five points of contact with the fingers, the uh, phenar eminence, the flexors of the forearm, the biceps, and then even the uh, contact at the vertex of the head uh, with the pec. The cradle hold, on the other hand, uh, again, it's almost, you can think of it as like rocking a baby, right? So, hence the name cradle. And so you have uh, the hands more on either side of the neck uh, and with more uh, full contact of, the, of both hands versus actually having the five point of contact with the chin hold. And we'll talk about the different techniques, uh, different segments at which you may use the chin hold versus the cradle hold. A variable factor for the chin grip position is the wrist position of the short lever applicator that is uh, referring to the right wrist of the operator in this case. So you can have the pistol grip where, you're more, where the radius is in line with the first metacarpal, or you can have more of an extended grip or extended wrist. And this is shown with uh, the wrist uh, there where you can see that uh, it's no longer in line with the uh, the, radi the first metacarpal. Uh, this is based upon, uh, again, patient positioning, comfort, and the practitioner's uh, preferred means of being able to get adequate leverage at the target segment and in their application of the thrust itself. So as, a, as you may recall from the pre-lecture material, uh, and we'll just summarize it again, that when applying the cervical spine thrust mobilizations, the amount of rotation varies between 30 and 54 degrees. The amount of flexion is also highly variable with two degrees versus 30 degrees. And then the side bending, uh, again, six to 30. The large, ranging, the large range here likely is secondary to whatever your primary lever is whether you're, and whether you're doing an upslope or a downslope uh, technique. Uh, the derotation is about five degrees, and then this can vary, however, up to 16. And then the amplitude of the thrust is also highly variable. Granted, keep in mind that the amplitude of the thrust is also proportional to the amount of derotation or the coming off of the barrier uh, prior to the thrust. Uh, the derotation de displacement is significantly correlated, as I mentioned, uh, not only with the amplitude, but the the velocity as well as the peak thrust acceleration. Thus, the, D, the more derotation displacement, uh, this leads to more thrust displacement, uh, better velocity and acceleration in occurring. That being said, uh, you want to use the least amount of amplitude as possible to be able to induce the desired effect. 
okay and then when we're looking at peak velocities mean velocities and the duration and amplitude of the thrust so 120 70 degrees per second on average it's 72 degrees per second uh, the mean duration is 800 to 200 milliseconds so it would look like this in practice The four techniques of the cervical spine that we'll be going through today are the occipital rotary thrust, the AA rotary thrust, cervical rotary, and the prone CT junction lateral flexion. Each of these techniques will be shown with a video in the following slides. Uh, the lab manual provides detailed descriptions and the logical flow and steps as previously denoted with the QR code so you can see uh, the videos uh, at, at your own pace and in your own time. And then also the practical portion uh, will be also beneficial in further denoting uh, the explicit knowledge of these techniques. The occipital rotary thrust technique. You can denote that the chin hold is being used for the C1 or C0, C1. The five points of contact are shown there. With the fingers, the thenar eminence, the flexors of the forearm, the biceps, and then the chest wall or pec. Notice the angle of the position of the feet of the operator. Primary lever is going to be rotation. Side bending introduced. Then there's going to be a PA shift and slight extension. The alternative positioning or vector with the left hand of the operator here would denote whether you're going to use the extension or the pistol grip for the right for the left wrist, even though it's hard to see within uh, the current uh, image. Preliminary manipulative bumps, priming, and then the actual application of the thrust. Thrust, sharp and short with a defined onset and a rest. Duration, less than 200 milliseconds to elicit neurophysiologic responses. Target 30 to 120 milliseconds in the cervical spine. In brief, but not necessarily in this order, are tips. Extension and PA shift using index finger up on the atlas to engage AA joint. Side shift away, keep it straight. Here's an example of the lower cervical spine uh, rotary thrust manipulation. And you've previously seen this video. Now, the slight change from the last one is that there's going to be uh, introduction of slight flexion in order to take up the additional tissue slack, secondary to the amount of mobility of the patient. And this is determined by the operator based off his feel. Mm -hmm. Primary lever rotation, secondary lever side bender, lateral side glide, and then thrust. Okay. okay. Cervical thoracic junction. So there's two videos shown here. One to the left and then one to the right. 
Okay, so we're going to jump down to the lumbar spine techniques, uh, describing them in detail, just like we did with the cervical, as far as like the biomechanics and the locking mechanisms. And then we're going to go through the lumbar rotational and neutral technique, also known as the lateral recumbent. Okay, next we'll go into the lumbar spine, HVLAT, mobilization techniques. Okay, so when we're considering the minimal leveraging barrier uh, creation in the thoracic and the lumbar spine, we can see that the chart is similar to that of the cervical spine, where you have the spinal level uh, denoted in the first column, the typical coupled motions, and then the facet oppositions that would otherwise be introduced. Uh, do note that at the cervical thoracic junction that there is a lot of inconsistencies with the couple motions that occur as type 1 and type 2 have been described. Uh, that means that you as a clinician will have to use uh, clinical judgment and or feel patient comfort uh, and patient uh, spinal ranges of motion available necessary to determine what facet opposite apposition that you otherwise want to apply in order to create that minimal leveraging and that tissue tension uh, barrier. Then with the spine inflection and or extension, uh, your coupled motions will change. So in your flexion position, uh, we'll stick to the lumbar spine as there's been a little bit more uh, consistency shown with this, is that flexion and rotation will occur in the uh, same direction naturally. So then you would want to introduce side bending and rotation to opposite sides. Versus if the spine is in a more neutral and or extended position, type one coupled motions predominate. And do note that it's also been described that coupled motions can occur differently at different lumbar spinal segments. And so uh, again, though this is good in theory, it may need some modification when you actually go to apply the techniques. Uh, uh, so uh, with the assumption that type one is occurring with neutral and or extended spine, then you would introduce side bending and rotation to the same side. Let's consider these three images shown below. And really the concept that I wanna convey here is the subtle changes in the amount of flexion that is introduced and the amount of torso rotation that can otherwise occur. Uh, so in that first image, you have the neutral spine and that naturally the amount of rotation available is gonna be in this individual uh, about 35 to 40 degrees. And then if you introduce flexion either above or below uh, you can see that there's additional rotation that is uh, otherwise available secondary to the, uh, uh, the tissue tension uh, that is reduced and also you're no longer, the facet joints are no longer in more of a, a closed down or uh, closed pack position. Now it's up to the discretion of the therapist or the operator and the patient's comfort uh, as far as like how much flexion you otherwise introduce in order to optimize the amount of rotation. Predominantly the lumbar thrust is going to be more of a rotary uh, based thrust and so if you're already taking up a lot of rotation in the pre-setup then you, uh, you're going to be thrusting closer to that end range and so keeping in mind how much rotation there is to start uh, will be important for patient comfort and safety. Okay, so we'll take you through a brief example here. So the patient's position in the starting position on her side as shown in the previous slide. And then the step one would be introducing a little bit of rotation. Denote that this is for your neutral and extension positioning uh, for your facet app position. So the couple motion that predominates here is side bending and rotation in the opposite direction. And so with the step one, the rotation, the right rotation is introduced. And then with step two, uh, right side bending is introduced. And you can see this by, uh, again, because of the static nature of the image, you can't appreciate it, but with his forearms, he's compressing uh, both the iliac crest as well as uh, the upper torso. Um, and so his forearms are coming together, introducing that right side bending positioning. And that would create the facet opposition that is ideal 
which is going to be your type 2, where side bending and rotation occur in the same side. And uh, an additional tip would be that uh, you want to seek the tipping point prior to actually uh, applying the thrust. And we'll talk about this, but this is essentially that before you get the patient, before you apply that step two, is that you, you're going to want to see that the patient can act, the patient will actually balance on their side. Uh, and you do this by gently rocking them and then they would naturally fall back into the starting position. Uh, and we'll go through this in the lab. Okay, so looking at an example of the lumbar spine with additional flexion. So when the spine is in a flex position, uh, we can expect there to be natural type two coupled motion where rotation and side bending would want to occur in the uh, same side. And for our facet opposition, we want to introduce uh, op like type one uh, uh, coupled motions. So we'll use uh, right rotation as the same example, but instead of compressing, uh, trying to introduce that right side bend, we're going to want to introduce left side bend. And a simple means of being able to do this is introducing a towel roll. And you can see that uh, the patient is positioned on top of the towel roll there, uh, where uh, it is introducing left side bend to produce the uh, opposing uh, motions or coupled motions. The other alternative is uh, you can see that the uh, practitioner here is artificially inducing it uh, with his force, uh, the forearms, uh, and the, you can see the black arrows denoting that uh, he's actually separating or promoting that that side bending position in, uh, towards the left in order to introduce the uh, appropriate facet opposition and create that minimal leveraging uh, barrier. Uh, also note that the patient's right arm overhead would also bias left side bending, so that's an alternative, but again, uh, this is based upon patient comfort uh, and or um, like shoulder range of motion, et cetera. Okay, just like the cervical spine, we'll talk about some scenarios where you're dealing with a stiffer and a more flexible uh, lumbar spine. So the first example is the stiffer spine. So you can see that it, you're gonna utilize, or the practitioner here utilizes ligamentous myofascial positioning, i.e. using more of a flex position without a towel roll or without manually applied uh, opposite side bending. And this is, uh, again, utilizing not so much the, uh, the joints themselves, uh, uh, but rather like the myofascial component as well to get to that minimal leveraging positioning. Now, that being said, uh, you can also utilize the table. So take the second example, where you have a more flexible spine. And so inside lying, uh, presuming that we're in the neutral and the extended position where you wanna introduce uh, both right side rota uh, right rotation and right side bending uh, then you can utilize the table the head of the table uh, to uh, introduce the lateral flexion and this is likely going to be more comfortable for the patient as the uh, th therapist does not have to utilize uh, external forces to otherwise uh, promote the uh, right side bending Okay, so the upper body hold of the patient can vary, and the hold positions selected for a particular technique is, are based upon the three different variables. It enables the operator to effectively localize forces to a specific segment of the spine or, and or rib cage, delivers a high velocity, low amplitude thrust force in a controlled manner, and it prioritizes patient's comfort. So here's the traditional hold where you have uh, essentially the you can see the left forearm or the operator is gently resting on the lateral axillary border of the patient <clears throat> here is the pectoral hold where the uh, the palm or the the heel of the palm is located over the uh, distal aspect of the pec upper arm hold is where you can actually utilize the uh, arm of the patient as leverage or as a stabilizing force. Uh, the challenges here are the fact that uh, 
because you're now one joint removed from the uh, torso that there can be a loss of stabilization at the joint of the shoulder. And then you can also use the elbow hold. Uh, so though the contact pressure is at the elbow and its uh, name suggests as much, the forearm and you can see the, the uh, meat of the flexors of the operator are located uh, more proximally uh, close to the anterior joint line of the shoulder, but not directly on the shoulder itself. Just like the upper body, there's also several variations of lower body holds for the lumbar spine rotary technique. So you have the pronator pelvic hold, the pronator hip hold. The similarities between these techniques are the pronation of the forearm, noting that the flexor wad and soft tissue is predominant contact for the patient, regardless of whether it's at the hip or the pelvis. Uh, this just ensures uh, improved patient comfort uh, as the uh, the uh, when contacting with the ulna uh, can be a little bit more uncomfortable. Uh, pronator spinal hold. So the contact uh, of the right hand of the operator is at the spinal level. Supinated hip hold. So once again, uh, trying to uh, reduce the amount of bony contact of the operator's forearm against the patient. So there's not usually as much uh, uh, like soft tissue mass on the extensor aspect of the forearm than there is on the flexors, but this is an option. And then the hypothenar hold in which the hypothenar eminence is the predominant contact or pressure point and that would be right at the mammillary process or just lateral to the target segment. And this is going to be the one that we predominantly teach uh, within today's lecture and lab. Okay, so a bit of review from the pre-lecture material. So you have the spinal region denoted there throughout the lumbar spine. The number of distinct cavitations that we can expect is, has varied. Uh, but on average, uh, 5.27 with a variance between 2 and 9. You have the unilateral cavitation occurring in 93% of uh, uh, subjects in one study and up to 40% in another. And then you can predict as far as like the upside is uh, slightly more uh, likely to cavitate than the downside of the patient. Bilateral cavitations can occur in up to 60%. And then the distance from the target segment can be as much as five centimeters. Uh, keep in mind that the cavitation is one and a half times more likely to occur bilaterally rather than unilaterally. Greater than one segment above or below the target segment is likely to cavi uh, cavitate. Within L5, S1, and SIJ HVLIT, there is no statistical correlation between the anatomical level of the cavitation sound and the adjustment techniques selected. Uh, so that's also important that there to note that regardless of the technique that you select, that there is a bit of predictable variance that the cavitation may uh, not be correlated specifically to the target level. Oh, okay, so in this study, they did two types of spinal lumbar spine techniques. One was the L5 pull, and the other one was localized to the uh, SIJ, the sacroiliac joint. And you, the graph here, I'll orient you so you can see the number of cavitations uh, for each of these techniques shown in the on the y-axis. The red uh, bars representing the cavitations from the L5 pull technique whereas the black bars represent the lower sacroiliac joint technique. And then the small triangles that I've put along the x-axis uh, denote the level or segment uh, that was targeted with each of the techniques. And then the microphone location, uh, as shown by the, um, uh, by the different uh, uh, categories, L4, L3, L4 right, L3, L4 left, etc. And the patient was lying on their left side. So the rights uh, uh, represent the upside, whereas the left side here denotes the downside uh, of the cavitation. Uh, 
and what we can see is that uh, when applying the L5 pull, the L3, L4 upside facet cavitated more often than the actual target segment itself. So this was uh, a full two segments or uh, segment junctions, if you will, above the target region. And then the SIJ cavitated at the L5 S1 upside facet more often than it did at the actual target segment of the SIJ. The results indicate that the two different methods of manipulation did not produce cavitations at significant different significantly different locations and thus uh, you could expect as much uh, when performing these techniques within the clinical setting. Oh, okay, so the preload force, so the amount of force that is applied prior to the thrust is about 27 pounds of force. Uh, the duration is between 139 and 150 milliseconds. The peak force that is applied is about 95 pounds of force. And then the thrust rate is 0.8 pounds per millisecond. And so you can see the technique here, uh, patient in a neutral spinal position. From what we talked about previously, you can note uh, the coupling motions that, that are otherwise applied. So she's in right rotation. This is a neutral spinal technique. He's using a, the pronated position of the, of the bottom segment at the hip, and then he's using a forearm or elbow grasp of the upper. And you can see the thrust applied there. Okay, so the one lumbar spine technique that we will be uh, introducing today is the lumbar rotation in neutral. Okay, so here's a video of the lumbar mammillary process rotary technique. This can be used throughout the lumbar spine at L5, L2 through L5. We'll get the setup. We talked about trying to get it to your BMO. Uh, I like to have a little bit lower. Okay, I'm flexing it to no particular level. And rotation. So he's just on the edge. He talked about like the tipping point, so he should rock, come back to the same point. My theme, hypothemar eminence is like right all along the mammary, mammary process of L5, L4, <coughs> depending on my target segment. Andrew's going to feel like you're going to fall off the table, but you're not. I'm going to roll him. Roll him as one segment towards me, then I'm gonna have an inhale and an exhale. I'm gonna exhale with him and then I'm gonna thrust. Okay, here's a slightly different variation of the mammillary uh, process rotation. The primary difference, notice the holds at the upper and lower body that Taylor uses with this technique as compared to the last technique, as well as the height of the table that is used. So he's using the pronated spinal uh, grasp. So we're going to come back now to the cervical techniques, uh, lab part two, uh, now that we've uh, allowed our bodies to go through the refractory period. And we're now going to talk about the OA joint, as well as the mid cervical cervical rotary uh, technique. Okay, in the last lab section, we had gone through the uh, AA joint, as well as the prone CD junction lateral break or lateral flexion technique. In this lab section, we're going to go through the occipital rotary thrust technique for the uh, upper cervical spine, as well as the mid and lower cervical spine cervical rotation.
the occipital rotary thrust technique. You can denote that the chin hold is being used for the C1, or C0, C1. The five points of contact are shown there. With the fingers, the thenar eminence, the flexors of the forearm, the biceps, and then the chest wall or pec. Notice the angle of the position of the feet of the operator. Primary lever is going to be rotation. Side bending introduced. Then there's going to be a PA shift and slight extension. The alternative positioning or vector with the left hand of the operator here would denote whether you're going to use the extension or the pistol grip for the right for the left wrist, even though it's hard to see within uh, the current uh, image. Preliminary manipulative bumps, priming, and then the actual application of the thrust. Here's an example of the lower cervical spine uh, rotary thrust manipulation. And you've previously seen this video. Note the slight change from the last one is that there's going to be uh, introduction of slight flexion in order to take up the additional tissue slack secondary to the amount of mobility of the patient. And this is determined by the operator based off his feel. Mm -hmm. Primary lever rotation, secondary lever side bender, lateral side glide, and then thrust. Okay. All right, last but not least, we're going to move through the thoracic spine techniques. And uh, this includes the upper thoracic AP extension, mid thoracic AP flexion, and mid thoracic PA extension. So the thoracic spine, high velocity mobilization techniques. Okay, before we get underway with the actual techniques itself, I do wanna highlight the regional interdependence that exists within the thorax. So it's been said that the treatment utilizing both thrust and non-thrust thoracic manipulation has been shown to result in improvements in pain, range of motion, and disability in patients with a variety of upper quarter conditions. And you'll see this as you go through the clinical practice guidelines for the cervical spine in particular, as well as for the shoulder, um, that these techniques can be really effective at treating and improving uh, these metrics within these non-thoracic joints. So in a survey out of the UK that surveyed uh, rehabilitation practitioners and the clinical use of thoracic HVLATs for musculoskeletal complaints, uh, you can see that there's an incredible spectrum of different musculoskeletal complaints or conditions that the HVLAT for the thoracic spine were utilized for, um, starting from the elbow and everything, including other, considering like headaches and uh, CRPS, the lower limb, as well as the wrist all the way up to the, the rib and the cervical and the shoulder. Um, so uh, I think this gives you a, a good idea as to uh, how thoracic spine HVLATs are being utilized in practice. And then if we look at this same data in a different perspective, we can see that uh, HVLATs for the thoracic spine are actually more often used for other body regions than they are for actually thoracic complaints, be that rib or thoracic spine. All right, similar to the lumbar spine, there's different variations as far as the upper body positioning and holds. Uh, we'll start off with the patient positioning. And again, the factors that may influence this, again, are going to be that which enables the operator to effectively localize forces to a specific segment of the spine and or rib cage. The delivery of a high velocity, low amplitude force in a controlled yet sufficiently high manner uh, 
um, based off the patient's body habitus, and then prioritizing patient comfort. So here are the different variations that can uh, be uh, utilized within the thoracic HVLATs. So the first is what they call the W technique. You can notice that there's a bit off center of the elbows from one to the next. The second is the V technique, where the elbows are stacked right on top of one another. And then in the case where a patient's shoulder cannot otherwise maybe tolerate the uh, impact of the thrust uh, or the pressure, then a single arm technique can be uh, utilized. And then the third, or excuse me, the fourth uh, variation is with the arms behind the head and the uh, force of the operator is going through the long axis distract uh, the long axis uh, point of the humerus okay and then we also have the different uh, closed fist versus half closed fist options as far as the short lever applicator meaning the hand that's underneath the patient with the supine techniques so based off patient preference as well as uh, operator preference and the comfort at which uh, they are able to apply the thrust. So I have a preference for utilizing or holding a small towel within my closed fist. Uh, that being said, I, I know Taylor previously has mentioned that he prefers not to utilize uh, a towel. Uh, and then the third option would be where you would adduct the thumb Give it, kind of flexing the thenar uh, wad or muscle wad, and that is going to kind of create a the the barrier, and then the spinous process will go uh, just right along the medial aspect of the palm, uh, following the uh, the line of your palmaris. The half closed fist is quite similar. Uh, the different options here, uh, again based off operator preference and patient comfort. Okay, a bit of review from the pre-lecture material. So you have the spinal region, we're focusing on the thoracic. You have the number of uh, distinct cavitations. 82% of thoracic manipulations will uh, create more than a single cavitation, and these can range anywhere between two and six. The distance from the target segment is 3.5 centimeters. And the skin fascial interface, like the amount of glide that you can get uh, from uh, the initial contact point, is between three and four centimeters. So 54% of thoracic spine cavitations were deemed to be accurate, less than that 3.5 centimeter error in the upper thoracic spine, and less than 4.5 centimeters in the lower thoracic spine. When in the when only two cavitations occur, there's less likelihood to cavitate the target segment. Greater than equal to four cavitations have a high likelihood of actually cavitating the target segment. Thus, it's more advantageous to have more cavitations. Thoracic spine HVLAT uh, segment level cavitation error is significantly less as compared to that of the lumbar manipulations, as uh, you saw with it being over five centimeters, the distance from the target segment. And then finally, since the skin fascia interface has negligible friction, you must take up approximately three centimeters or one and a quarter inches of skin slack prior to the thrust of the thoracic spine in the prone position in particular. Okay, you've seen this diagram on, in the pre-lecture material. So the benefit effects of the spinal manipulation thrust may be associated with a generalized nonspecific force in the vicinity of the target segment rather than the well-defined force applied to the precise target segment. Uh, so for clarity again you can see the target segment denoted by the small triangle. You have the accelerometers there's three of them placed along the spine here and then you actually have the location of the cavitations and you can see that uh, despite uh, the fourth vertebra uh, being uh, the target segment here is that you, uh, the individual uh, ca cavitated all the way up to almost a CT junction at times. Okay, so then just a quick reminder on the thrust application. 
So the vector is perpendicular to the long axis of the target segment. The duration of time is between 120 and 200 milliseconds. The preload force that you're applying is about 26 pounds of force, uh, but there is considerable variance here, and this will be based upon uh, the relationship of the body size of the operator to the patient, as well as the overall comfort of the patient and their sensitivity and the amount of uh, flexibility is felt within their spine. The peak force is up to 111 pounds of force, uh, but this, again, can vary anywhere between 53 and 141. A force at an angle of 45 degrees to the spine will reduce the magnitude of the force by up to 70% and may make the difference between the cavitation and no cavitation. Thus, uh, that vector in relationship to the long axis of the target segment is critical. Uh, peak force or peak thrusting force is closely associated with the amount of preload force. Thus, uh, the more preload you have, the likely the higher peak force will be when you actually go to thrust. A stiffer joint requires both more preload and peak thrusting force compared to a soft joint or one that has more mobility to begin with. The three thoracic spine techniques that we'll be going over in lab today will be the upper thoracic AP extension, the mid thoracic AP flexion in supine, and the mid thoracic PA extension in prone. So here is the upper thoracic T1, T3, HVLAT. Set up with the uh, one leg extended, uh, the far leg is going to be flexed. You can add or re reduce tension by so if I pull up, that's going to uh, re uh, release tension, uh, or is going to increase tension because the thoracolumbar junction is going to pull, or fascia is going to pull. Otherwise, this is going to be the position. Adds a little bit of, of obliquity to the pelvis that is going to help with the countering movements and the, and the secondary levers up above. Additionally, this foot is going to be used to help leverage the patient over while you get your soft fist at the top of the thoracic spine. So we're doing a high thoracic, like T1 through 3, uh, manipulation. Okay, so towels under the patient. You determine whether towels are necessary by doing an AP, also checking for shoulder stability, ensuring that they feel comfortable, no pain, or any apprehension of posterior dislocation. Okay, so you're going to roll the patient over. Uh, the spinous process of the target segments um, is going to fall uh, just here. Uh, I'm going to have a little bit of uh, ulnar deviation like that, and my forearm is going to fall just uh, just lateral to uh, the spinous process, but uh, medial to the medial border of this far scap. So it's going to be like this lying under him. I'm going to roll Taylor over. Okay, I'm going to pull down and come come across. Then from that segment forward, or uh, above, I'm going to side bend away and rotate towards me to lock it in. I'm going to get his elbows over my epigastric region. I'm going to inhale, exhale, and I'm going to drop. Okay, mid thoracic flexion. In the cephalid and posterior direction, usually a 45 degree angle. Okay, and then mid thoracic extension. So, uh, Gretchen, you thinking like right through here? Uh, or like, or, or right there? there? Yeah, right there. Okay. Oh, God. Notice the so do positioning up. of the come on, come small on. Oh, okay. lever applicator. Oh, God, there it went. Oh, God. There was two. Yeah. So you felt that first one before you even pushed? <laughs> All right, and then in closing, we're gonna just go through some summary statements, um, some additional resources, uh, and op uh, open dialogue about any open loops or questions, comments, or concerns that you currently have with our conclusion.
Okay, and now in conclusion uh, of today's presentation, I would want to leave you with a couple of summary points and resources. So accompanied with the lecture and the video that you're currently watching, we've also included the high velocity, low amplitude thrust lab manual. Uh, I've tried to really provide this document as a means of a one-stop shop to translate the knowledge and the skill set that you've garnered uh, during this uh, presentation and during this uh, lab section. And you can see uh, the table of contents of what's included in this. Uh, it, it, each of these are hyperlinked uh, within the lab manual itself. Uh, there is a, a considerable amount of information here, but what I have found is that previously participants have not gone back to the slides um, as there are numerous and it may otherwise not be as readily available and may not necessarily translate directly into clinical practice. So hence the lab manual serving that purpose. You can see that we've also included not only algorithms for each of the uh, different uh, spinal regions that we discussed, uh, different workflows as well. And then we've also included the description of the techniques, Q, uh, QR codes and hyperlinks uh, to the video content so that you can continue to uh, elaborate, review, and extend your learning even beyond today's section. Uh, as we talked about within the reflective model, or the continuous improvement model, it, which is otherwise a necessity for us con continuing, particularly with this type of skill where it's uh, really more of a psychomotor skill than it is just uh, simply knowledge based. And then accompanying the resource of the lab manual, as I alluded to, is that uh, you have ongoing access to the YouTube playlist, which is the high velocity, low amplitude manipulation techniques. There's over uh, 123 videos. Uh, some of them, uh, majority of them are open access and you should be able to see them readily. Um, some of them uh, may otherwise be protected just for uh, proprietary reasons, but otherwise this should also provide additional resources for trying out different techniques now that you know that the general uh, the general principles of the different spinal regions and as discussed it's not enough just to attend today's session the lecture the lab uh, and uh, walk away and really have this skill down uh, it's going to take continued improvement, uh, metacognition, self-reflection, and the continuous improvement model that we've discussed to help to really make go from a uh, competent and, and confident clinician to really an expert uh, within this skill set and being able to uh, apply it across a variety of different patient presentations and demographics. So additional reading on the physics of HVLIT can be found in the primary resources shown here. Additionally, the arthrokinematics and additional introductions uh, in uh, further detail on a lot of the information that is presented today uh, can be found in these four resources. Uh, Gibbons and Tehan, uh, Herzog, Donald Newman, and Gregory Maitland's texts serve as a comprehensive means of really honing these, uh, the explicit knowledge of these skills. Okay. Additionally, further courses that I would recommend are uh, the Spinal Manipulation, Manipulative Institute. Uh, they have a certification course. Uh, this is uh, quite rigorous in nature. I've heard it's even a little bit more challenging than the OCS from those that have taken it. Uh, you, it involves four courses and then there's actually the in the fourth course, the certification course, is a written as well as a practical examination. Gibbons and Tehan spinal manipulation courses and then also Medbridge uh, has a couple of Gibbons and Tehan's uh, additional uh, courses and then uh, I believe there's other practitioners on there that uh, have courses on spinal manipulation and high velocity, low amplitude thrusts, uh, not only for the periphery, but also for the spinal manipulation. Okay, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, please feel free to leave your comments, questions, concerns, and feedback 
in the sections below or contact one of us in uh, that is to say myself taylor or lauren directly we'd be happy to answer uh, and provide further detail when and where appropriate